a very significant occasion for all of us. It's the first Sri Mohandas Moses Memorial Lecture. And to proceed towards the event of this evening, I first uh, invite Dr. K. Kasturi Rankin, Director of National Institute of Advanced Studies, to welcome and to say the opening remarks. Sri Anand Boraji, Sri Mati Achala Maulik Moses, Mr. Ram Murthy, other distinguished colleagues and friends of Mr. and Mrs. Moses, very esteemed participants in today's lecture. At the outset, uh, it's my proud privilege to welcome all of you to this first in the series of a lecture that uh, INIAS will organize in memory of one of the very distinguished bureaucrats this country has ever seen, Mr. Mohandas Moses. In particular, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Sri Anand Boraji for accepting the invitation from Srimati Achala Mala Moses Malik, as well as myself, to come and deliver the first in the series of these lectures. I would also like to invite all of our distinguished guests, Professor Solai, uh, Robert Sorabji and others, Mrs. Sorabji and others, uh, to this event. And uh, we hope that uh, you will have a interesting and fruitful stay, continued stay in Bangalore and interacting with the Institute after the Center of Philosophy was inaugurated by the professor from Oxford very recently. I should say that uh, this is a lecture which has been, which uh, was accepted as one of the important events of the Institute after a discussion with uh, Srimati Achala Moses when she came and expressed a desire to institute such a series in the name of her husband. It is certainly, it was certainly a privilege for this institute which normally is very selective ultimately because you have to maintain a certain level even when you accept such offers, the generous offers. And uh, so we discussed it and uh, obviously it was not only fitting in with the kind of framework that we have at the Institute of uh, people whose memory should be perpetuated because of their broader contributions to this country, but also uh, because of the fact that uh, they have contributed and enriched the society through their thoughts and actions and writings. So it was a great privilege for us to accept this off, generous offer from Srimati Achala Malik Moses. And uh, we are grateful to you, Madam, for entrusting this privilege to us and uh, also in helping us to choose the most illustrious speaker who can do justice, we are sure about it, uh, to perpetuate his memory. Mr. Mo, I will say a few words about the man about whom we are going to, in whose name we have instituted this uh, lecture series. Mohandas Moses joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1959 and served in several diverse posts with distinction. Moses was born in Langoon, Burma in January 1936 went to school in Kunur and later at Rangoon, where, I think it's Yangoon nowadays they say that, where his father was posted at the Indian Embassy in Yangoon. His brilliant marks at the GCEA level exam secured him a seat at the London School of Economics, but he could not join due to the family reasons. He joined Madras Christian College and obtained his master's degree in economics and mathematics from Madras University. Continuing into the administrative service, which he joined in 1959, 
as a young deputy secretary of finance department and uh, this is in 1972 he wrote a three volume report Mysore taxation inquiry report on which the state government based its future fiscal policy in 1972 he was regarded as an expert in all aspects of financial management at the young age of 40 years he was a remarkably successful labor commissioner who set new standards and procedure in labor reconciliation and negotiation. As Home Secretary, did a large-scale recruitment of state police personnel in which a condition he made of being chairman of the committee was that no recommendations will be allowed, a very bold decision. The officers recruited were considered the finest in the service. He introduced new bus routes connecting remote parts of the state and was responsible for the new illumination and dancing fountains of Brindavan Gardens. As managing director of the Karnataka Power Corporation, he completed major hydel projects at Kalinadi, Nachkhari, Supa, and established Raichur Thermal Power Station. In 1985, the then Chief Minister stated in the State Assembly of the remarkable work done by the managing director, that is uh, Mr. Moses, and his team. As managing director of the Food Corporation of India, he transformed the functioning of the Food Corporation of India. From 1990 to 1993, he served as secretary in the ministries of Agriculture and Welfare, Government of India, and was secretary coordination in the cabinet secretariat. As Secretary of Agriculture, Sri Moses was also Executive Director of the Oil Seeds Technology Mission, where he did much to promote the cultivation of oil seeds, pulses, and red oil palm. As Secretary of Welfare, he took a new initiative for the rehabilitation of the physically and mentally challenged. He also submitted to the Government of India an authoritative report on the Narmada Valley project. In June 19, January 1994, at the height of militancy, Mohandas Moses was appointed as advisor to the Governor of Jammu and Kashmir. He headed a large number of development departments and was advisor in charge of Ladakh affairs. He received appreciation from the office of the Prime, then Prime Minister for his work. The present Prime Minister, who was then the Finance Minister of India, congratulated Sri Moses for his excellent financial management of the state of Jammu and Kashmir during the 1994-1996 period. Mohandas Moses wrote for newspapers and journals while in college. Later on, his articles ranged from literature, irrigation, food security, power generation, heritage conservation, economic development, and so on. As advisor to the governor of Jammu and Kashmir, he wrote and submitted a report on restructuring of education in Jammu and Kashmir. While serving as advisor Jammu and Kashmir, he began writing a book on his experiences and reflections on Kashmir and Ladakh, titled Rajatarangani Be Revisited which has been incorporated in the bibliography by Srimadhi Achala Mahamasas, which has just been completed. As advisor JNK, again holding the portfolio of health, he saw many cases of brain injuries, some caused by terrorist violence, its effects and its treatment. It was this which impelled him to begin extensive research on the nature of the brain-mind relationship and the impact of artificial intelligence on the human mind. Mohandas Moses had completed last frontiers of mind in November 2003 and was preparing to write to publishers when he suddenly passed away in December 2003. This book has now been published by Prentice Hall of India and has received high praise from eminent scientists and philosophers in excellent reviews. The first edition has been sold out in five months 
It's also now co-published abroad. He has completed a book on the great Indologist Sir William Jones and East India Company scholars. This book is being published or has it been already published? It has been published. It's just going to be published shortly. Nias is indeed honored to host this important lecture and on tour to have Sri Ennan Boraji as the first speaker delivering this. I'll say a few words about Sri Ennan Boraji. He was educated at Punjab and Oxford universities, was a member of the Indian Administrative Service between 1959 and 1994, born in the Punjab state cadre. After the Sino-Indian conflict, he served in the Special Services Bureau in the Western Tibet border areas and underwent training with SARS of UK, was the Home Secretary of Punjab when the state was disrupted by terrorism. With the Government of India, he served as Joint Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Additional Secretary Defense, Secretary Defense Production, Defense Secretary, Home Secretary, you can just imagine the string of very important resp responsibilities that he held. Ricky was recalled as Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister. In fact, uh, when I was the Secretary of Space, I had the good fortune and privilege of working closely with uh, Varaji when he was the Principal Secretary. And I could get a taste of the working of his mind, his creativity, the type of incisive questions he used to ask on issues that encompass several dimensions of, uh, dimensions of the India space program. After retirement, served as a Director India International Center, New Delhi, member National Security Advisor Board, Chairman National Task Force on Internal Security, Chairman Review of Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, Chairman Committee on Review of Military Histories, member CSACP National Committee, Co-Chairman Indo-European Union Roundtable, as well as Special Representative of the Government of India for the JNK Dialogue. So you have really today one of the very eminently qualified person who could speak because of his varied roles, varied experiences and exceptional achievements. We welcome you, Sri Vara uh, to this important uh, function. I would also fail, be failing in my duty if I don't mention about Mr. S. Krishnamurti, the former Chief Secretary of the Government, uh, State of Maharashtra, he has flown down specially to Bangalore just to be with us on this important occasion. We very much appreciate your presence here today. And finally, I would like to once more thank Srimati Achala Maulik Moses for this generous gesture and entrusting us with this very prestigious task of holding this annual lecture series. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I now invite uh, Srimati Ajala Maulik Moses to share her dear thoughts with us this evening. <coughs> Dr. Kasturi Rangan, Dr. Raj Gopal, Mr. Ramurthy, Mr. Vora, participants in this senior executive training program, and my dear friends. I express my deep felt gratitude to Dr. Kasturi Rangan for enabling me to institute this annual lecture in remembrance of my husband, Sri Mohandas Moses. As he was born in the month of January, it is intended to have the memorial lecture in this month to the extent possible. It is appropriate that Nias, with its intellectual traditions, its robust debates, and unfettered discussions, should be holding this series of lectures. The Tatars have been identified with the promotion of talent and merit, and it is here in Nias, at the Indian Institute of Science, and at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bombay, that we see the results of their humanistic and eclectic outlook. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is difficult to speak of a dearly loved person in an objective manner, nor will I attempt to do so. Mr. Ramurthy and Mr. Vora, two distinguished civil servants who are close friends and colleagues of Mohandas Moses, will be telling you of their recollections of him. What I would like to tell you is my intention in instituting this lecture in his memory. Our increasing, increasingly cynical world emphasizes pragmatism, in inverted commas, a sort of neutral no man's land where all is permitted, where expediency takes precedence before principles. Mohan believed in ideals and he succeeded in infusing those who worked with him with the belief that it was possible to attain success without a Faustian bargain. In other words, without selling one's soul. Many young officers have told me in the last two years since his passing away of how reassured they were by Mohan's invincible belief that ideals have to be pursued. Today's world lays an obsessive value on success. And in this fiercely competitive world, Mohandas Moses did attain a large measure of success. But he did this not by compromise or psychophancy or intrigues. His achievements, very high that they were, and sometimes quite incredible, were attained by a determination and dedication that left no room for flaws or failure. But if this superb efficiency was all, it would be a cold and impersonal chronicle. Mohan brought to his work a true spirit of service to help, to console, to heal, whether it was getting power stations functioning ahead of schedule or distributing food grains in every corner of India during the great drought year of 1987 so that there would be no hunger deaths, setting up schools and hospitals in terrorist-ridden Jammu and Kashmir, or to stand in the snow in front of the health centers in JNK to personally supervise the first pulse polio immunization programs for small children. He received high praise and acclaim from both the central and state governments for his work and lots of appreciation from ordinary people. He never once sought recognition or reward, which is natural for most humans to want. Friends, I would like to read out a few sentences from a letter that General Krishna Rao, who was governor of JNK, when Mohan was advisor to the governor, passed on to me recently. In fact, he very much wanted to attend this lecture, but could not do so due to indisposition. General Rao had proposed a high honor for Mohan and had spoken to the then Home Minister about it. And he was told that they would require his biodata and a brief resume of the work done. And they would certainly consider him for this award. And this was Mohan's reply to the governor. Respected sir, Thank you for your letter of 20th September. I had advance intimation of it from my wife, and I was told that out of the goodness of your heart, you intended to recommend me for an award for the work done in Kashmir. I carry with me happy memories of the three years spent in Kashmir as part of your team. It was a great privilege to have worked under your inspired leadership. It was your presence in JNK which was the crucial element in bringing about a proper atmosphere for holding elections in Kashmir in 1996. The pleasure and privilege of having served there has given me much more satisfaction than any award could possibly bring. In view of this, sir, I am not enclosing my biodata and I'm sure that you will kindly understand the reason for this solitary act of disobedience.
Born to the Christian faith, Mohan was both a good Samaritan and a true karma yogi. He believed in doing good deeds without hope of reward. That, I think, he left to the highest judge. Thank you. Thank you. They were really moving words from you. Let me now invite Sri S. Ramamurthy for his presidential remarks. The founder of this annual series of Mohandas Memorial Lectures and my dear friend, Srimati Achala Maulik Moses, the director of this institute, Dr. Kasturi Rangam, my good friend and the keynote speaker of this evening, Mr. Narinda Vora, and distinguished participants, including a number of good friends of mine whom I have known for five decades or more, I think. To me, I mean, when I was invited a few days back by Achala to preside over this meeting, I was overwhelmed. I said, look, you can get somebody very much more distinguished than a civil servant who is enjoying his well-deserved obscurity and well-earned obscurity. She said, no, you have been a good friend of Mohan, so you should come. So in that sense, to me, it is a privilege and honor to be here to be associated with this series of lectures. I had the good fortune of knowing Mohan for almost four and a half decades, commencing from 1959, when we entered the Indian Administrative Service together, till he passed away, some in December, I think, 6th December 2003, if I remember rightly. In fact, a day or so after he passed away, when I was in Bombay, I stay in Bombay, a day or two after he passed away, a cadre mate of mine from Maharashtra rang me up. He said, your friend, Mr. Moses, I learned, has passed away. I just couldn't believe it. I was stunned because in my batch, he was one of the most health conscious of people. His, I mean, he was absolutely conscious of his regimen, his daily workouts, I mean, Every day he used to do his jogging, swimming, whatever it is. His eating habits are absolutely Spartan. And however hard he worked, he ensured that the mental stress did not get to him. So there is absolutely no reason to expect that he would pass away. I just couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. Then a question arose, is this wrong? Whom do I ask? I mean, whom, with whom do I check up? I mean, somehow I thought it would be rather crass of me in case he had not passed away to ask somebody in Bangalore, has so and so passed away. I didn't know. I checked up on the internet at random. And then I was sh shocked to find, yes, he had passed away. The matter had been reported in the Bangalore papers, and the Bangalore papers had been reproduced on the internet. Thereafter, that evening, I said, I must talk to Achala because. I know Achala and Mohan have been very deeply attached to each other. And ever since their marriage, I have known her closely. Yes, I must ring her up. Then what do I tell her? How do I console her? Because it is a no words can console a yeah, loss of a spouse, yeah, such a close spouse, after so many decades of togetherness, when they have been very, very close to each other, when they have been each other's strength and support. I rang her up. Of course, she was inconsolable. It, she did tell me that, look, it's totally unbelievable. Just a few weeks back, Mohan had a complete health checkup, and he was given a clean bill of health by the doctor. In fact, she didn't anticipate it at all because she was in Calcutta at that time. I mean, when the actual death took place, she was in Calcutta at that time, and. Uh, she had absolutely no idea that a catastrophe was around the corner. And when it, of course, 
she was inconsolable and I just, no words could console her. And there, I mean, then I sort of thinking of Mohan, to me, I have known him closely for, I mean, we have shared a number of interests. A lot of memories overwhelmed me, came to mind. Then, I mean, I recollected, look, we, we were both students from the Madras University. Of course, we were in different colleges, different courses. I was doing statistics in the Presidency College, Madras. He was doing economics in the Christian College. We didn't know each other then. We came to know each other after we entered the IAS and we joined the IAS training school which was located at the Metcalf House, Delhi at that time. Of course, this is an occasion when I mean, the IAS training school, like probably the training schools of a number of people who directly enter into the superior services, brings together a lot of people, disparate people, disparate personalities from various parts of the country. Some people are sportsmen, some are musicians, some are who read right at the beginning of their career about uh, what card up to join, how do they get seniority, etc. But Mohan was a person who took things as they came. He was a person who delighted in the pleasures of life, living as it is. He was not sort of looking ambitiously to becoming this or becoming that, etc. And somehow we bonded together quite closely. Of course, there are aspects of Mohan, the certain anecdotes which uh, maybe even Achala might not have been aware of till I mentioned to her. That is an age, you know, at the age of 23, 24. And we are still young, we are still sort of barely out of college. There is a certain impishness about him. He liked playing pranks. And some of these are, I mean, totally harmless pranks, not intended to harm or stun or shock anyone. And I remember one occasion when we had gone on part of a Bharat Darshan tour, if I remember rightly, it was the city of uh, Chandigarh. He then picked up a phone and rang up somebody at random. And a lady picked up. Of course, while I wouldn't know what that lady said, I can guess from Mohan's reply as to what she would have said. And uh, then Mohan said, Madam, is your refrigerator running? The lady would have said, yes, of course. Then he said, then why don't you go and catch it? It's a time and there's some sort of, uh, of course he put the phone down. Of course, this is just harmless fun. It didn't, probably the lady at the other end would have laughed and would have kept the phone down, saying it's a prankster, etc. But otherwise he delighted in life, the joie de vivre that they call in French. That is something. Then, October or November, we, the training institute shifted to Masuri. It has expanded as a national academy of public administration. Now, Masuri, this is, I mean, we spent quite a few months in Masuri, and that was one place where Mohan and myself came into much closer contact with each other. We shared one common passion. Both of us loved going on hiking. And weekends in Masuri, you can go to various spots. Sometimes the destinations that you choose in advance. Sometimes you just explore it random. Sometimes with friends. Sometimes the two of us alone. But he was the leader in the sense that he used to plan. I remember one occasion when three of us were to go to a place called Danalti. That is about 15 miles away from Masuri on roads, etc. And Mohan knew how to sit about it. I would have not imagined because I was totally new to government, a government service, and the area I am in. What happens? How does one proceed about it? Yes, for two, three hours walking to Kempty Falls and back is one. But how does one plan a weekend trip? Then Mohan, he knew that, look, there is a foresterist house. This is the place you go to for getting reservations. Now, these are the places where you can get sleeping bags, etc., of other things. Where do you get a backpack? Where do you get a sleeping bag? All of that had worked out. Of course, for the three of us, what will we need for over a three-day period? And the total weight 
if I were to say 2x was the 3x, let us say, was the total weight we had to carry. Mohan carried 2x, I carried x by 2, and uh, our third colleague carried x by 2. So he carried about three to four times our backpack. We were probably groaning under the limited weight given to us, but he was vigorous. I mean, he could uh, sort of carry that backpack and be still cheerful in law. And to the Gold Waterfalls, he took me to the Sharavati project, he could explain. He was thrilled by nature, he was also thrilled by the uh, some engineering aspects of the Sharavati project and law. And that was sort of, there's something versatile about him and uh, he sort of, he said that was those two days again. It was an enjoyable stay, I recall with pleasure. Thereafter, I think he spent some time in Bader and then went to collector, went to collector Karwa. And I could, shortly after Karwa, he was posted to uh, the Vidan Sauda. I knew at that time that because from Vidan Sauda I used to be present and he used to ring up Achala. And he had, Achala had completed a training in Masuri. That was her first posting. And Mohan and Achala developed a close bond which resulted in marriage. And that was, I think, the finest decision Mohan made and I think finest decision Achala made too. And I don't think either that is, there is a very close bond between the two of them. And it after their marriage, of course, I had heard about Achala before Mohan knew of her because uh, her uh, father's former colleague and boss, Mrs. Vijayalakshmi Pandit, happened to be governor of Maharashtra. When I called on her, she said, the daughter of a very dear colleague of mine has chosen to join the IAS in preference to the foreign service. And said, what's her name? She said, Achala. So, before Achala knew about me, I knew about her and I had heard about her choice of IAS in Karnataka. So it was, I mean, when Mohan married Achala, I was delighted, look, I, I get now uh, another friend, a close friend. And uh, thereafter, of course, he has seen a number of posts and then I knew that he was working in this taxation reforms panel under Mr. Bhutalinga. Of course, I have always associated Mohan as a person who loves poetry, literature, science, everything. Taxation reform, of course, although he was a, a graduate in economics, but uh, this is some mundane subject about tax rates and uh, etc. It so happened that shortly after he submitted the report, I had to do some similar work in Maharashtra. In that context, we got the report from the Karnataka committee. The chairman of this taxation committee was one Mr. Bhutalingam, who was one of the most distinguished civilians of those days. And uh, uh, Mr. Bhutalingam praised uh, uh, Mohan's work to the skies, which even today can be found in the introduction to the taxation inquiry report which led to the further uh, state tax structure of Karnataka. Thereafter, of course, I've seen, met him in Karnataka Power Corporation and as managing director. And one could see the, the enthusiasm of uh, Mohan about getting things done and he was in charge of getting this Raichur thermal power station completed. I mean, I remember all the, although I belong to the Maharashtra cadre, I would not be knowing about these things on a day-to-day -day basis because of my interaction with Mohan, I knew that this power station was completed in record time by him. After, there were enormous difficulties because completing any project is no easy joke given the red tape, given the problems that we do have. And he did manage to complete it. Thereafter, probably residents of Bangalore will remember that uh, year. I have forgotten the year, but I do still remember the newspaper reports at that time when he was Home Secretary. There is a circus in Bangalore which caught fire while the show was on. It was at 9 p.m. or something. There were lots of deaths, lots, lots of injuries, and Mohan was Home Secretary. Within a few minutes, he rushed to the spot, organized the relief, 
and ensure that although the deaths are irreversible, at least the persons who have injured, etc., could get some speedy relief, etc. That is, he was a person who was interested in ensuring that things are done to help the people as soon as possible. And during his some time thereafter, he was posted to Delhi. There again, while on the one hand, he attended to his official responsibilities. In his spare time, he would go around Delhi, study the monuments, study their history, etc. He was a, a walking encyclopedia of Delhi's monuments. And not only when I say walking encyclopedia, not just information. He can communicate that information with a certain enthusiasm, with a certain zeal, which has been unmatched. Of course, we shared a common interest, a large measure of commonality in books. Although his background was in economics, he used to love reading a lot of non-fiction in science, in travel writing, in metaphysical, philosophical writing, etc. And sometimes, very often, it used to happen that books which we would have independently read and then said, yes, I've read it, I'll read it. I remember, for instance, there is a well-known book called, I hope I'm not uh, stepping beyond my time, uh, Peter Matheson, The Snow Leopard, which is part travelogue, part philosophical discussion, etc. And I had read it separately, he had read it separately. Then there is a book called Gary Zukov, The Dancing Woolly Masters. It is about some basic physical principles, physics principles and all. And, uh, and normally speaking, you don't expect an economic graduate to keep in touch with science writing. Or Robert Jung, brighter than a thousand suns. That's Ramil. And uh, his uh, book, recent published book indicated, which I had not discussed with him at that time, that he had studied in detail the two books of Roger Penrose, Empires of the Mind and Shadows of the Mind. And I must confess, Penrose's style is, notwithstanding my mathematics background, is a bit, uh, when I would have preferred a somewhat uh, uh, easier style, but with Mohan there is no problem. And there are books which even now on my, are on my to-do list. I remember Hofstadter, Gaida Lescher and Bach. This is a book for decades I've been saying, I must read it one day, I must read it one day. Mohan has read it, understood it, digested it, assimilated it, and you can see it in the recent book he has in Mohan's book, which has been published posthumously, Frontiers of the Mind and stuff. And, of course, there, there's one area which we did not discuss in books. Of course, I do spend a lot of my time in what perhaps would be considered frivolous reading like fiction and humor and mystery and detection and all. That is, I don't know whether he did. I mean, if he had read those books also, then I wouldn't know where he found the time, how he found the time. And thereafter, after, I mean, I'm talking of his later postings, after he came to Delhi, he was chairman of the Food Corporation of India for some time. This was an occasion when he was interested with uh, the medical relief mission to Jaffna, that was probably the year 86 or 87, actual year, I don't recollect. And he used to talk of the dangers of going to Sri Lanka, of taking that, but there is, it was a situation where in the conflict between LTTE and the Sri Lankan and IPK of forces, it was, his life was at risk, but the fact that he is taking relief to the people who need the relief, that was what enthused him more. And he was commended for doing this as something beyond the call of duty. Then when he came to Kashmir as advisor, I remember this is an incident which I have not discussed with him, but I saw in the newspapers at that time. It was a 26th January parade in Jammu. The year I have forgotten, but uh, it was in Jammu. The governor was taking the salute. I think the parade was just about over or something. There was a major explosion right close to where Mohan was sitting, which was near the days. I mean, the governor was 
on the days. Mohan was quite close to the days and probably Governor Mohan and others were the targets of this explosion. Explosion took place. The governor was with heavy. The others were running helter skelter from whatever I understood. Mohan had shrapnel wounds but still stood his ground for organizing the relief to the people who were injured, who have to be taken away by ambulance, etc. There were a number of deaths, including probably some deaths of his own subordinates or something, which is ghastly. But that indicated that he didn't mind placing his, I mean, he, the, even when his life was at risk, he could sense, he had this sense of duty. And this is, I mean, this aspect of Mohan recalls to me a, a French phrase, a chevalier of some purse, on reproche, a knight without uh, fear, without flaw, etc. That was something about Mohan that every job that he undertook, he gave it his maximum dedication. He didn't bother about personal risks he had to undergo. And he showed, brought in a lot of enthusiasm. But at the same time, he was not a person who was sort of totally with his nose to the grind without any other interest. He had a lot of extraordinary other interests, as I was saying. He had interest in science, he had interest in history, he had interest in archaeology. He could relax with a book of poems, etc. And he, then he also did not uh, neglect his health and all. Neglect, he took, I mean, he was attached to his wife, he was deeply attached to his son, and he was a good friend. He could always find time to spend, to relax with uh, close friends and all. In that sense, he was one of the most remarkable personalities. The way he passed away, of course, it does cause a, a tremendous uh, sort of sorrow. But at the same time, there are occasions when I think there's a favorite Sanskrit uh, phrase that goes, anayasena maranam vinadainyana jivanam. That means when you live, you must live a life of dignity. When death comes, it must be quick and painless. So however much the sorrow that Mohan's parting might have caused to Achala to others, we must recognize the fact that he achieved something that would have been considered eminently desirable. A life of dignity and a death of and death in dignity without any pain, any such a quick and sudden death. Of course, it is something that was unanticipated should not have been there. In the, uh, one wishes, if today had been there, he would have been in his eighth decade of a very productive life, would have continued. But he has gone. It's his memory that is with us. It is this we need to cherish. And although, of course, I had put down certain things that all of us can learn from his life, we will just quickly go through this. Something that if can Mohan's life teach anything to us as people who are in various walks of life, whether we are civil servants, whether we are in any other career, one, whatever be your life, let honesty and personal integrity, intellectual and financial integrity, be your true guidelines. Whatever be your assignment, you can always find it challenging and give it your best. Every assignment discharge with dedication is a service to the public. And whatever be your assignment, do cultivate some pursuits, the world around you is full of interesting things, if you know how to look for them. Do not forego the pleasures of reading. With increasing pressure of work or studies and the easy availability of mental uh, numerous distractions, both adults and children give a very low priority to general reading these days. This is rather unfortunate. In the long run, whether you are working or retired, the reading habit can help you keep your mind active, broaden your horizons, and enable you to reduce, if not overcome, mental stresses. However busy you may be, do find adequate time to be with your spouse and children. The spouse should not be taken for granted and should not be ignored and neglected. The years when children grow up to be teenagers and adults are the best years 
both for the children and for the parents. The children should not feel that their parents were not was parent were not there for them when they were growing up. Do not neglect your health, nor take it for granted. There's an old Sanskrit saying, Shariram Adhyam Kalu Dharma Sadhanam. The body is the basic tool for discharging your responsibilities on earth. Do not ignore that. When young, a number of us do tend to take health for granted. And if we do not take adequate care when we grow old, we do become liable for numerous diseases, BP, diabetes, whatever it is. Do not let mental stress get to you. You must, apart from physical fitness, ensure that you are mentally, you do uh, remain stress-free, whatever is needed, yoga, meditation, etc., you should do it. Enjoy the blessings that you have been given. Rather, moan about things that you do not have. But when all is said and done, also realize that life has its ups and downs, throws up surprises, pleasant and unpleasant. It is up to us not to be swayed unduly. By these and take these take things as they come with a measure of equanimity. I once again thank Achala and Dr. Kasturi Rangan for inviting me to be here and to share some of my memories of this very remarkable civil servant and a personal friend of mine, Mohandas Moses. Thank you. Thank you. The first Mohandas Moses Memorial Lecture by Sri N. N. Vora on the future of the bureaucracy in changing times. Dr. Kasturi Rangan had to catch a flight, he's gone away. Uh, I'd like to thank him and all his distinguished colleagues in this institute, Mrs. Moses, the near relations of my friend Mondas Moses who are here today, my former colleagues in service whom I met after some time, distinguished participants of this course and very distinguished guests who are here this, with us this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is late in the evening. I would not uh, indulge in the in the uh, uh, <clears throat> what I would normally have done, and also recalling my long years of association with Mondas Moses. But let me say in one sentence, my colleague Dr. Ramamurthy has spoken at some length that Moses was a very, very bright, uh, very keen mind. He was unpretentious. He was not uh, ambitious. He never did anybody any harm. And what I liked most about him in terms of our common interests was that he was as agile as a mountain goat. He would uh, go scampering up the hill and uh, go for uh, treks and go for hiking and mountain climbing. And wherever uh, in the midst of nature, uh, you could not restrain Moses <coughs> at all. It's a good thing that uh, Achala has established this, uh, instituted this memorial lecture. I cannot claim to be uh, the person best qualified to have been called upon to deliver this uh, first uh, memorial lecture. But having been asked to do so, I feel <coughs> enormously privileged uh, to be associated with this evening's program. Uh, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, the, the, uh, coming to the... Uh, the subject that uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan and Mrs. Moses had selected for me to speak on, uh, future of bureaucracy in changing times. Now, uh, the wording of this title would suggest, it appears to me, I may be wrong, that uh, those who have framed this or thought of this have uh, doubts about the future. Uh, there is a certain element uh, of, of uh, doubt, or more than a certain element, that possibly bureaucracy has no future in the coming times, especially in the context of the dynamic changes which are taking place and the quick changes all over the world. Now, um, before I speak on, on what, what my own experience uh, in regard to this subject is, uh, let me say very, very briefly that bureaucracy is a word which is far too 
comprehensive it, it is. It relates to the entire administrative apparatus uh, in regard to the management or governance of a particular defined administrative unit, be it a state or another territory or, or the whole country. So to that extent, uh, um, bureaucracy, when we use the word bureaucracy, in, in the context of our own country, which is of subcontinental dimensions, a population of 1.2 billion nearly, <coughs> enormous diversity uh, in terms of devotion to religions, uh, nearly 600 languages and dialects, and uh, a culture traditions which are rooted in the holy past. Uh, it, is, it is an enormous task indeed uh, to, con to, to juxtapose it in terms of governance and bureaucracy. So I would say perhaps a better word in the Indian context is, is public services uh, and uh, more so because if you talk about the entire gamut of public services in, in our uh, country, the central government employees, the state government employees, the central public sector, the state public sector, the local self-governing bodies employees, that is the urban local self-governing bodies, the rural uh, local self-governing bodies, and what else you have. Then the figure crosses 20 million of uh, the total number of employees. But let's not get excessively uh, uh, depressed about uh, such a large number, which appears to be 20 million employees in this country. Uh, it isn't really that big. Because we, we uh, have given a bad name to bureaucracy or to public services as such, to the entire range, the entire spectrum of public services. So therefore, when it comes to a figure like 20 billion, uh, it is uh, even more depressing. But if you look at this figure, at all, such as it may be today, because this figure is slightly out of date, uh, we have a variety of figures floating around, so one doesn't know which one is uh, more accurate and more to date. Uh, then you find that it is no more than 2.5% of our population. And if you compare this 2.5% with uh, other developed countries, you find that it is a, 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 a very insignificant percentage. Scandinavian countries have 16% and uh, UK, uh, which is uh, from where we inherited our pattern of governance, 13%. USA, 8%, uh, Japan, which is uh, supposed to a very compact administration, 4.5%. So it's not something which worries me excessively, except that when the system doesn't work, then um, it is the whole system is uh, uh, not relevant, it is not productive, and therefore it is a waste, and it gets a bad name. Now, in the totality of what I said is bureaucracy or public services, let me uh, seek to, to try, attempt to uh, speak within the short time available more on the All India services uh, because they are supposed to be at least assumed to be the leaders of uh, uh, the governmental apparatus in the states and also the leaders of the uh, mechanisms which obtain in Delhi in the government of India at the centre. So it would perhaps not be altogether irrelevant to, to focus more on the uh, civil services, the Indian Administrative Service, the Indian Police Service, and the third All India Service which we have, the Indian Forest Service, which came into being much later. And then we have an entire range, entire gamut of central services, which are uh, not All India in the sense that these three services are. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we, we uh, come to the conclusion or, uh, or decide that it is, uh, it is so, whatever it be, uh, it would be useful to, to uh, briefly recall the genesis, uh, the uh, basic foundations which led to the establishment of uh, these All India services. When, the, uh, when it was decided that we would become free from the British uh, colonial imperial control and rule and emerge as a free country along with Pakistan, at that time um, the uh, the country was governed by covenanted services, the Indian civil service, the Indian police, uh, and uh, we had the engineering services, we had the health services, but there were many more All India services in British times till 1935. And when uh, Diaki was established with the Government of India Act 35, uh, these various All India covenanted services 
were reduced to uh, one third. And uh, more so because uh, then the Indians uh, started playing a role. And the ICS, who were members of the provincial legislatures, they were no longer so. Uh, they were not uh, the uh, little Napoleons and uh, uh, dictators, as they were so-called at that time. And they were replaced by the elected elements. So when the uh, Constituent Assembly debated the future and the style and pattern of governance that the country should adopt, and some of the best minds in the country comprising the then political leadership from all parts of the country, all caste, communities, religions, assembled together in the Parliament Hall for almost three years, near three years, to, to evolve and finalize this volume called the Constitution of India. There were heated debates uh, for, for a fairly long time. But the Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, particularly the interim Prime Minister, uh, alongside several other very eminent uh, national leaders, was openly and clearly opposed to All India Services. He wanted a severance, a clean uh, separation from the colonial imperial tradition and his own experiences as a political personality uh, in dealing with the ICS and IP uh, was, to say the least, quite unsatisfactory and he did not want any continuation. He said, if we are to make a beginning, if we are to, to go ahead, if we are to build a new uh, country, India, and the nation building task must not relate to a continuation of this unfortunate colonial tradition. He was joined in the sentiment by some very eminent people like Vindwala Pant, uh, Malana Azad and others. But uh, as it happens in history, uh, there are other views and there are other schools of thought and there are other personalities who are perhaps uh, more effective or more persuasive. And this particular personality I am talking about, Sardar Patel. He was more the homebred indigenous uh, kind of uh, political leader as compared to some others, particularly Pandit Nehru who was uh, Eton and Harrow and uh, Cambridge and London School and the Inns of Law and so on. So he said that in his perception, in his experience as a political leader in one part of the country in central India, this uh, new India, free India, would not remain free and not united for very long unless we had the services of all India service officers in various areas of specialization. And he said, if you do not want a united India, let us not have all India services. So he uh, virtually bulldozed, he got around the provincial chief ministers and on one particular evening he got some resolution passed and he virtually um, bullied everybody through the establishment of all India services. As time subsequently did establish and, and uh, through, uh, Patel was not that wrong as we may be inclined to, to assume or think today in terms of uh, the reputation of bureaucracy or public services, or more particularly the All India services in recent times, one could say, yes, Pandaji was right and, and Patel was wrong. The basic reason why I'm saying so was that in the debates, what came out was that India, as the British left behind, was impoverished. It was poverty-stricken. There were severe regional imbalances in terms of uh, development of any kind. The British had ruled India for their own purposes, for their own imperial objectives. So it was Patel's um, thinking, uh, also supported by several other notable personalities, that you will uh, have an All India process, you select the best available talent, impart to this group of best available talent, the best uh, available uh, possible training, and then allocate them to the provinces which became states when the constitution was adopted. And you would therefore have a uniformity in the quality of advice being tendered to the political hierarchy. You would also have connectivity between the states and the center. These uh, young civilians, when they were trained and allocated to the states, uh, would be posted in the field, they would be closest to the ground, and they would gather that experience which is invaluable they will work with and through the people. And when they came, according to the scheme of the All India Services, on spells of central deportation, they would bring with them this invaluable field experience uh, 
the hard realities and while working in Delhi contribute this hard experience, so real ground experience to policy formulation and in the process also develop a wider All India perspective, a wider vision which on the course of time when they reverted to the states uh, would contribute to widening the horizons of the state governance and so on and so forth. Now, again, the second uh, assumption which is relevant in terms of what we are seeing today or recent times was that All India services would be useful, relevant, productive, valuable uh, for two reasons, uh, on account of two grounds. One, that they would be free to give the kind of, render the kind of advice which the country needed in the provinces, in the states and at the center. Uh, they would be unfettered. And B, uh, within the scheme of All India services, they would be protected from any uh, insecurities, interference, or any kind of influence. Now, whether these assumptions have worked in the manner they were conceived, as I have just now stated very briefly, uh, or not, is quite another matter. As, as we will soon see in the next few minutes that I have, uh, the assumption that they will be protected through this umbrella of All India Services, with the central authorities being the cadre controlling authorities, has worked the other way around. That protection has come from the states, from where the threat uh, was supposed to come, political interference, extra legal, extra constitutional influences. <laughs> now they are hand in glove with the state leaders. So there is no need for a central authority to protect anybody. So the legacy, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we had and the concept and the foundations and the assumptions of All India Services were all very fine and, and they were well intended. And uh, now, did they work well? Again, very briefly because of the time, I would say 47. You go back to uh, those of you who are much younger than some of us here. Uh, 47, uh, I, my family, along with millions of others, we migrated from areas which have become Pakistan to areas which were declared to be India. The number of people killed was in hundreds of thousands. The number of refugees were in millions. Uh, it was a holocaust, the violence, the looting, the burning, the killing, the rape, and so on. And uh, miles and miles of human beings traveling barefoot in a particular direction, which they call the new, new land, land of freedom and promise. So we had this uh, um, uh, enormous challenge of criminality, violence, total disturbance of law and order, a near famine-like situation in terms of uh, non-availability of scarcity of foods and other essential uh, ingredients of survival. And uh, who dealt with all this? This resettlement business, the civil services of the day. Who were these civil services? They were not all IES and IPS. It took time to create them. They were officers drawn from the armed forces, defense services, who volunteered, who had joined the second war effort, not because they wanted to be in the military, because that was the only job available. They were all very highly educated. They were academics, people who had become teachers, again for want of other, who volunteered. There were people who, who were just nobodies in princely states who had, had education abroad and so on. So it was an amalgam. Uh, and what was left behind by the British in terms of uh, the movement of Muslims to, to Pakistan and the movements of uh, British uh, elements along with the Christians, Anglo-Indians and others, some of whom chose to, to leave service, some of whom chose to go to other parts of India and not serve the government, some of them chose to go back to England or Australia or New Zealand or wherever they wished. So it was a highly fractured kind of uh, governmental apparatus. But over a period of time, the challenges were met and met successfully, thousands of Russian shops and what not, you know, all this was done. Now quickly again, the first three decades after we attained freedom, I'm not going into to a specific milestone because of the time, but I would say roughly till about the end 60s when the uh, Congress was divided from within, when uh, new factions developed and there were feuds and uh, problems. I would look at this period and say that uh, with historical uh, hindsight, you would say that by and large we were on the path of progress. And we had ups and downs, serious ups and downs, and I'm not going into the fact that within about four weeks of our gaining freedom, 
uh, Pakistan had invaded uh, um, Kashmir. We had this 47-48 war. So we had many problems like extreme scarcity of financial resources, infrastructure non-existent and so on and so forth. But we managed, we were settling down. First 30 years saw expansion of health facilities, expansion of educational facilities, emergence of universities, new institutes of learning and research, science, technology, IITs, and the business institutes came later, establishment of the Atomic Energy Commission, a space, a planning commission in, the, in terms of the context of planned economy. We had the National Development Council, the planning commission, some of the best minds of the day were members of the planning commission economists, statisticians, and so on. Now, one could look back and say that the entire approach to planned economy was rubbish. That's another matter. I will not go into that. But I would say that these 30 years or so, roughly, uh, led to uh, the foundations were laid. Uh, the fruits, some of the fruits which you are seeing today, uh, where have all these boys and girls suddenly come from, these hundreds of thousands who are doing this or that, they are, you could be critical and say they are second grade products, you know. They are products of very poor institutions. You are dissatisfied with the system. Okay. But yet they are there. If you look at the global picture, you look at the Chinese picture. Yes, you have so much skilled manpower. Maybe the level of their skills could have been far, far better. But you have the IIT uh, uh, graduates, uh, that category, the Institute of Science, Bangalore, and so on. And then you have other institutions which call themselves engineering institutes and so on, colleges, regional colleges, not as good perhaps, but yes, the manpower is there. So these foundations were laid. Uh, we were living from hand to mouth in terms of food, food cereals, food grains. And uh, the, the slogan was ship to mouth because if the ships didn't come from the United States carrying those PL480 food grains, uh, rusting shops closed and there was near famine. How did the Green Revolution come about? First, large dams, expansion of irrigation systems. You bring in experts to, to teach us uh, from United States, Ohio State University, Ford Foundation grants, um, modern practice of agriculture, new practices, um, chemical fertilizers, fertilizers, weedicides, fungicides, pesticides, harrows, tillers, tractors, unheard of before. You've had the irrigation systems. Consolidation of land holdings, uh, settlement, uh, not everywhere in the country, unfortunately, but uh, all this paved the way for what is called the Green Revolution. So, ladies and gentlemen, in brief, uh, to conclude this phase, um, we were well on the path of progress, nation building, till political uncertainties and other happenings overtook us. Then came that sad period, 75-77, emergency attack, assault on the cabinet system, assault on the parliamentary system, assault on the principles of governance. And unfortunately, at that time, the unleashing of this new ideas and new um, slogans and new concepts of loyal, committed civil servants, committed bureaucracy, unheard of. Committed to whom? Committed to a group of people. So we went through that unfortunate phase. Then we went through political uncertainties of one or the other kind of political combinations, um, coalitions coming. I saw the Congress out, saw the Congress back, the same electorates. And then you had two spells of Janta government coalitions again, back again to Congress. And more recently, you saw the Gauda government, the Gujarat government, and by NDA, Mr. Bajpai's government. And now you have the UPA government. So earlier you had coalition governments in the states, and you sort of looked down upon that kind of situation. What's all this? You know, hodgepodge. They can't take any decision. They are weak, need characters, all politically variant characters, just got together for the sake of convenience. Over a period of time, you've seen the coalition system travel to Delhi, and not travel to Delhi, settle down in Delhi. And I do not foresee in the coming time that the coalition system will disappear and you will have a two-party kind of situation, much as the political scientists and other people who believe in neat formulations expect and hope it is not likely to happen, not in the near future. So, ladies and gentlemen, where have we got wrong when we talk of the future of bureaucracy changing times? Again, because of the paucity of time, I will be very summary and say 
that when you had this new species of uh, political leadership emerging and the first generation uh, phasing out, passing away, first generation, let me remind you, were people who had all, bar none, uh, been in the struggle for national freedom, who had made vast sacrifices, who had given up their homes, their families, spent long years in jails, and they had, they, uh, had no financial resources, but they had vast public esteem. They were leaders in their own right. And incidentally, the majority of them were highly educated. A good majority of them were lawyers, advocates. Some were journalists, some belonged to other professions, but none of them was from here and there. So when this first generation came in the provinces, in the states and at the center, A, they reflected a certain level of ideology, of a national perspective, of integrity, of honesty, of commitment. B, they knew each other. C, except one or two parts of the country, the same party was ruling the center and the states. So things jogged along. There were ups and downs, there were problems. When uh, the feuds came, factionalism came, and the new ideology became to, to hold and seize power at any cost, not to yield, then came the intrusion into the systems and style of functioning of government, the governmental apparatus, the mechanism of governance that started being impinged upon, encroached upon. And that process of politicization, which began 30, 35 years ago, is virtually complete now. We politicize the cadres. Let's forget about all India services, central services, state services. This is across the board politicization. Worse still, communalization. We are very conscious of caste, community, religion. Where do I come from? If I come from UP, which part of UP? All right, that part, eastern part. What is my caste? High caste, low caste, middle caste, OBC, MBC, whatever, you know. So it's, it's a very complicated situation. Now, because the style and pattern of electoral politics in India, the evolution of money and muscle power playing enormous role, um, it has impacted on governance in a very systematic and fund fundamental way in the last three, four decades, three and a half decades. If I have come into to, uh, the political system by spending a large amount of money which doesn't belong to me, which I have not earned, which I've got from here and there or extorted or whatever, then I need a yield on that, some of which, some of the obligations I have to repay. Then I need a governmental apparatus which listens to me, which uh, works at my beck and call, at my behest. And what is my behest? In summary, my behest is I want daily collections at all points, no one particular checkpoint, but every point you want collections done in the name of the political party or whatever. And once you get on that track of the whole administrative system, whether it's revenue or this or that, doing nothing but looking at opportunities of uh, taking some cash from even the poorest people who come for getting small things done, the whole system then is imbued with a particular syndrome of uh, being loyal to the master. Then in the process of this kind of uh, medieval loyalty, uh, I have appointed a particular person, a district magistrate in uh, Bangalore, superintendent of police or assistant commissioner of police in Bangalore. These two gentlemen are, they owe their loyalty not to the system, but to me. Therefore, who will, who will question them? How, will their superiors be able to question them if they do the wrong? Because I protect them. We are partners. What kind of governance do you expect uh, the civil services will deliver? If the system is fractured, it is uh, 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 liquidated, it is not answerable, it is not accountable. Individual elements are linked to the highest in the state system. To whom are they accountable? So this fractionalization, this uh, liquidation process has been ongoing for the last 25-30 years. So we have many treatises and uh, very scholarly works on what has gone wrong with governance, uh, roots of corruption, this, that or the other, so all debates and uh, need for Lok Yuk's Lok Pals.
which we are still to see. We, I've been hearing about the Lokpal almost since I joined service. Uh, where is the will to have a particular system enforced? Then can one particular person called Lokpal ensure the honest functioning of the entire subcontinental system? So, ladies and gentlemen, I would submit then that uh, while uh, things could have gone on with some small ups and downs, corruption is all over the world, maladministration to some extent is here and there, but we need not have seen these depths of despair of consciously eroding a system which is otherwise workable. There is no dearth of talent in our country. In any part of the country, in any caste, any community, from anywhere you go, you find very bright boys and girls. In fact, the younger people I meet make me feel ashamed. Uh, they're very qualified, they're very competent, they're willing to do certain things. But in the first five, six years, seven years of their service, they get knocked around so much, they lose their enthusiasm, they lose their value system. It virtually boils down to, are you willing to join the bandwagon or clear out or get marginalized? Most of them, and I'm not saying they do it for dishonest purposes, most of them climb the bandwagon for reasons of survival. The cynicism, the despair which has come. And there is no protection from within the system because the old days, the inspector general of police, the home secretary, the chief secretary, whatever you had, were role models. The father figures. One could find a way to their house or their office quietly in the dark and say, sir, this is what's happening to me. Most likely than not, you would be helped and saved. Now when you appoint chief secretaries and IGs and superior officers who are beholden to none but those who appoint them, they are not role models. They don't enjoy respect of any kind of esteem in the carders. So where do the younger or middle level officers go? They go by the quiet in the dark or not in the dark nowadays to the nearest MLA, MP or the Mafia character to, to get done what they have to get done. So it's a process we have unleashed. So there is no point in having intellectual debates about the future of bureaucracy. We have to set right. Executive is the elected element and the appointed element. It's not one who can replace the other. In a democracy like ours, we have to work together. I have to be totally loyal to my minister. Let there be no doubt about that. But loyalty does not mean that I will do everything that he can think of or not think of and I first give him the idea and then do it myself. And in the process, I benefit also. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that to, uh, because of the time again, that when you talk of the future of bureaucracy, my perception is that we still have whatever the figures are debating, Dr. Ramamurthy is a statistician, he knows better. Is it 23% or 23.5% of our population below poverty line? How 53% were still illiterate? How many are homeless? Uh, um, what is the situation? How many villages in this country out of 600 or 1000 have drinking water which is safe? How many have sanitation facilities, schools, colleges? Forget about colleges, schools, medical uh, dispensaries and other facilities for survival, employment, reasonably good health and uh, hopefulness. Now, all that is not there in, so let us say, I will not go into the number of millions, let us say roughly 25% of our population is still a cause for immense concern to those who govern the states and those who govern Delhi. All right. Now, are you arguing, as some people do in more sophisticated environments, as I have the occasion to be present sometimes, that uh, contract the government, liquidate the government. You don't need government. It's too much of government. Let the forces of competitive market economy take over. They will deliver. Deliver what? You have poor people in the remote northeast uh, states. You have people in the tribal Odisha, tribal Madhya Pradesh, far-flung eastern UP and uh, parts of West Bengal, in the hilly areas of Himachal and JNK and so on in the deserts of Rajasthan and uh, Kutch and Gujarat and wherever else. Which uh, globalized element or which deregulated element in our economy will provide them water or um, safe uh, haven, some kind of shelter called home and um, ensure that they have enough, they earn enough in cash or kind to eat, send their children to be at least literate, if not educated, and in the course of time they have hope of getting employment 
and there is some road system, there is some bus system, there is some medical system. It is a welfare state under the constitution and the director principles of state policy and what have you. It is our bounden duty in the, what we call the government to deliver. A governance must deliver. There is no, there is no um, second uh, option about it. When you get to the stage that you empowered everybody in the country, everybody is literate, everybody has a place to stay, everybody has reasonable food to eat, freedom of movement. When you fall ill, somebody looks at you, gives you medicine. That kind of situation arrives. Even then you will need government. And I will say another reason which is extremely worrying to me, and now as I am in Bangalore I can say it. Let us not all the time be looking at the economic indices and figures, rates of growth, this, that, 8.2, 7.9. One bomb here and finish the whole thing for next couple of years. Mathematician killed in Institute of Science, Bangalore. The uh, subversive forces have penetrated as far as southern states. If some of you must have been reading about the role of ISI and others for the last 15, 20 years. We've been doing breast beating, you know. Who's going to deal with the ISI and subversive elements, whether in Bangalore or in Chennai or in Tambaram, where? The globalized world, the deregulated, uh, the companies, the private entrepreneurs? It is the business of the government, the police, the administrative apparatus to do, deal with all these problems and see that these things don't happen, to provide that safety and security, that basic safety and security to all human beings living in our country, to all our citizens. So ladies and gentlemen, there is so much that I would uh, like to place before you in terms of my own perceptions and experience, not because I have better wisdom than my colleagues sitting here in this room, but I would say that uh, while there may be 100 solutions and 100 uh, options and 100, uh, way of, uh, 100 ways of uh, uh, going about uh, the job of uh, ensuring more effective governance or more good governance, etc., etc., I think one of the, the uh, most uh, extremely important uh, elements which we must restore to ourselves even within the mess that we have created for ourselves over the past for so many decades, is to withdraw the role of politics in day-to-day -day functioning. Let the politician be supreme in his own domain of a policy formulation, of doing all the more important things, and let those who deliver, like public service delivery or manage government offices, or do whatever they are appointed to do, uh, be totally answerable and totally uninterrupted. And they are answerable to their immediate superiors, who are answerable to the next superiors, whatever the administrative structure there is. You can improve upon it, you need not have so many layers, we've discussed that for the last so many years. You cannot impose the private sector pattern on everything. You will have to look at what is the problem that you are required to deal with, what are the kind of service you need to give to the people at large, then have that kind of structure of the system or apparatus mechanism to deliver. But it must deliver. There is no longer any choice that we can just discuss about bureaucracy and failures uh, in closed door rooms. Uh, people are getting fed up. Uh, cynicism, despair, frustration uh, lends itself very well to, to picking up the gun, and being uh, uh, bribed for 50 rupees, 100 rupees to throw a grenade. So if you want uh, societal order, you want orderly forward movement, then Social change and orderly change is something you cannot debate about, you cannot quibble about. But to deliver orderly change and equitable uh, social economic development uh, requires a great deal of effort and concern. And that effort and concern is the responsibility of governance in the Republic of India not of the private sector or the NGOs or those who go take PILs or the media which exposes us from morning till night uh, at great entertainment to all of us. So therefore I would submit because it's already 8 o'clock and I was uh, warned more than once to finish at quarter to 8 uh, that uh, there are various facets of various problems which I could have discussed at greater length uh, possibly to your satisfaction but I would submit ladies and gentlemen that we are a vast country with enormous talent, enormous potential. Uh, we have been our own enemies in terms of what we have been doing in our country. Uh, we take away those elements which are standing in the way 
and you would be next to none uh, anywhere in the world in the course of time. You give yourself a chance, give the people of India a chance and allow the systems to deliver. You don't need too much research in political science or governance to find out what is good for Bangalore or Mysore. Everybody living here knows it. All the administrators know it, the, the public knows it, the local uh, uh, the netas know it, the media wala knows it. All that is required is to ensure that whatever is good, practical, pragmatic, productive is allowed to be done and allowed to be done within a given frame, time frame at a certain cost and there is no question of defalcation or cheating or embezzlement or dishonesty as we see from morning till night and various supports coming out. So, uh, um, um, uneven as it is, uh, I've not been able to follow any course uh, because I had uh, calculated that I would need a certain time which wasn't there. So I apologize to you for this very uh, kind of uh, uneven presentation and uh, assure you with all the sincerity at my command that in 40 years and more that I have been involved <coughs> in one form or the other with public service uh, problems, uh, there is no dearth of potential, there is no dearth of talent, there is no dearth of honesty. We now so badly labelled, I live in 30 kilometres away from uh, Delhi, in Gurgaon, which is now becoming a very uh, speedily growing hub. I cannot go to the local market, ladies and gentlemen, and say I'm a retired IAS officer, or I used to be a secretary to the government of India in Delhi. I, ordinary, the, the class four pass shopkeeper will throw me at my face, say you are corrupt, so and so, use bad words. I had that happen to me more than once, when somebody, not me, uh, tried to introduce me to somebody else saying, you know, he was a secretary to government of India in Delhi and that kind of thing. So that other gentleman to whom he said this by way of recommendation, he let go. And he said all kinds of things uh, which were not very pleasing. So uh, what I am saying is that uh, our public image and our public esteem is now less than marginal. We have done it to ourselves. The politician has been helping himself. He's done it to himself. Uh, people running around from hotel to hotel, changing garments or whatever. A new style we have set up as we are in medieval Africa or somewhere, you know, shooting pigeons. Um, so we have to reckon with these things and uh, realize that this is not the way to manage and govern India, 1.2 billion people with poverty, with the backwardness, underdevelopment, regional inequities, social inequities, uh, classes and uh, ethnic groups which are depressed socially, economically and so on. All these problems are soluble and soluble well in time. I, I was asked in the beginning whether I would answer some questions. If any of you are willing to, because of the time, to ask a question, I will be more than willing to answer it. Thank you. It's uh, past eight, but I'm sure if uh, somebody is uh, really pressed with questions, uh, uh, Shreen and Vora has agreed to ask, uh, but very short and few, few questions. I think I really uh, total his experience and present uh, observation towards the uh, degeneration of the entire system, uh, including top to bottom level. Now, my question is, what is the remedy? Uh, we started with <coughs> a administrative setup, government who were associated with the freedoms <coughs> freedom struggle, and then under their supervision, after two or three decades, it started degenerating. And today we are in this position. So, what is our future? About 15 years. What I have been seeing as a former civil servant is three, four factors which indirectly are impelling us or compelling us to, to come to the track which we have left. One is a fast growing civil society in terms of their consciousness, their role and their impact on the totality of governance. There are specialized social activist groups, there are NGOs who are doing environment, some is doing pollution, somebody is doing that. Not all are of equally good 
quality and, uh, and discipline or integrity, even if I may say so, but taken together, they have an impact. The second fixture, which is again 10 to 12 years old now, is getting established, and the last evidence you saw only a few days ago, uh, is this business of the Apex Court accepting PILs and uh, giving directions, issuing mandibus, uh, writ jurisdiction of the Apex Court, giving directions to the centre and the state governments and what requires to be done in terms of the failures of the executive. The third element which is uh, very useful and uh, very productive if it remains within certain bounds of propriety and prudence and rectitude is the role of the media. The revolution in information technology is bringing news uh, to you on real-time basis. So the fact that I am not literate, I do not uh, read any language, but I understand the language to which I was born and I am in some remote village in Mizoram or in Manipur. I am looking at the local channel transmissions. I am hearing and seeing all the news of the day in India and abroad. So that awareness is improving, is enlarging enormously, much more than you uh, may perhaps reckon or accept. So uh, the media and its multifaceted functioning and the fact that the electronic media as enormous competition, you have now more than half a dozen channels, 24-hour news channels. Now sometimes things go wrong, they misreport or they, they are too much of a hurry. But the fact remains that uh, incidents or news which you never got sitting in Delhi earlier for 10 days, 12 days, 13 days, you are getting <laughs> within the hour or within the day and getting it on a holiday basis. So exposures are there and scandals are there and the sting operations and stung operations and all kinds of things are happening which are not particularly desirable in our value system, but they're happening nonetheless. So I would say, ladies and gentlemen, that there is in, in the environment now a growing dissatisfaction with what is wrong. And um, ways and means are being found to make life uncomfortable for those who are making our lives uncomfortable. So I would say that uh, while governance of form in the classical sense would mean this, that or the other, uh, you remember a few years ago we were so hotly discussing the need of presidential system of government in India. I had the privilege of uh, attending one or two such well-informed discussions. And I said, fine, you can discuss it for the next five, ten years. But where is that two-thirds clear majority in the parliament which will allow the constitution to be changed? We are nowhere near it. Maybe in the next 20, 30, 40 years of our evolution of our polity. I would like to ask anything because the lady is getting worried. <laughs> yes, I have to carry it. Yeah, the Right of Information Act, I didn't mention, uh, should have mentioned perhaps, but because of everything, it's very, very good news. But I'm afraid that we should not make a joke of this also. That every district office or subdivisional office or the central secretariat or state, 90% of the staff busy only in getting you the information that you need. We'll have to become prudent, relevant, what information is of general information, start posting it on the website or putting it on the newspaper board or whatever. And uh, that information which is a specific interest to a specific person or a party or a group or a professional interest, yes, we should have a reasonable period of finding it and giving it. But we should not uh, pervert this whole idea. Well, my fear is that having been in government for so long, you could virtually ask for anything now, barring those things which relate to national security. And uh, again, you um, um, rarify that whole thing, national security will, you know, in times to come. Now, today you are discussing which uh, nuclear power station will be in the civil list and which in the military list. Something that you had not uh, dared to think about, um, say, a year ago. Even in uh, Kusturi Rangan circles, we were uh, circumspect in what questions we asked them. Because these were not things we, we, you know. But times are changing. So, bureaucracy challenges in changing times. This is what it is all about. Well, gentlemen, I can see from your expression that you are dead tired and fed up also.
So we'll call it a day in the absence of Dr. Kasturi Rangan. I would like to conclude by thanking him personally and the lady will convey my sentiments to him and to, to Mrs. Uh, Malik for having uh, <clears throat> been party to seeing me here this evening, though I feel in the midst of my former colleagues that I uh, was not even the third most eligible person to have been asked to, to talk about this subject. But anyhow, a basic mistake was committed by Ajila, so you to suffer me. Thank you very much. To see the nature of the dynamic uh, nature of a bureaucracy in the changing times, none other would have been so appropriate uh, like Sri Anand Moraji to deliver the first Mohandas Mansus Memorial Lecture. On beha behalf of Dr. K. Kasturi Rangan, Director NIAS, Mrs. Ajala Maulik Moses, and the participants of uh, the 20th NIAS course for senior executives. I thank you, Shri Anand Mura, for taking the trouble to come here and to give this first uh, Mohindas Moses Memorial Lecture. From the start of uh, the organizing of this lecture series, uh, Mrs. Ajala Maulik Moses has, she has been interacting with Niyas and uh, we have been very touched by her passion and her desire to see this happen. Uh, I thank Srimadhi Ajala Maulik Moses for this evening and her passion to make this evening possible. Thank you. I also thank uh, Sri S. Ramamurthy for coming from Madras and uh, uh, giving the opening introductory remarks about his friendship and uh, association with uh, Sri Mohandas Moses. I finally thank uh, friends of uh, Sri Mohandas Moses and uh, Srimadi Ajala Maulik Moses who have assembled here, um, I, I wouldn't know, but I'm sure that a lot many are there in the crowd. So I would like to thank all of you also on behalf of director and the participants of this course. Finally, I would like to thank, uh, though he's part of NIAS, I would like to thank Professor S. Rajkopal, who has worked so hard with uh, myself and uh, Ms with Mrs. Ajala Maulik Moses and uh, the rest of NIAS to make this evening possible. I thank you, Professor Rajkopal. Thank you very much, all of you. <laughs>